<clears throat> Welcome to a special Easter Sunday edition of um, Harry Potter reading with me. Happy Easter, everybody. How are you guys doing? Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Nice to see you guys. Week three, Harry Potter. I believe it's been three weeks of this crap now. I wonder how long it's going to go on for. Maybe we'll get through the whole book. Maybe not. Um, what are you guys up to? Happy Easter. Hi. Hi. Welcome. 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 Happy Easter. Yep. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the live stream. Hello. Okay, well, I guess we might as well jump right in. I don't know how long chapter three is. Again, we're reading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. If you're just joining us, we're on chapter three. Uh, what happened to the bunny ears? Oh, yeah, I don't know where those went. <clears throat> Are you an actor? No. I hate acting. Okay. <clears throat> well, you guys hear me okay? See me? Let me just type this thing. Everything's okay. Okay, well, let's just dig in. Thanks for uh, joining me a little earlier um, today. I've got some Easter Sunday Zoom commitments, because that's all I can do. Yeah, let's get to chapter three. And I promised, as promised, illustrations. Okay, sorry, I was rushing around, I gotta get comfortable here. All right, let's dig in, chapter three. The letters from no one. <clears throat> the escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started and Dudley had already broken his new scene camera, crashed his remote control airplane, and first time on his racing bike knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed Privet Drive on her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. Piers, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid. But as Dudley was the biggest and the stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join in Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. This was why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays, where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school, and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had a place at Uncle Vernon's old school, Smeltings. Piers Polkiss was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuff people's heads down the toilet first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks. Said Harry, the poor toilet's never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smeltings uniform, leaving Harry at Mrs. Fig's. Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping over one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let Harry watch television and gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Smelting's boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later life. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her ickle Dudleykins. He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? He asked Aunt Petunia, her lips tightening as they always did, as, pardon me, as they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new, your new school uniform, she said. Harry looked in the bowl again. Oh, he said, I didn't realize it had to be so wet. 
Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It'll look just like everyone else's when I've finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table, tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall High, like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual, and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere on the table. They heard the click of the letterbox and flop of letters on the doormat. Get the post, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the post, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged the smeltling stick and went to the post. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who was holidaying on the Isle of Wight. A brown envelope that looked like a bill. And a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he'd never even got rude notes asking for books back. Yet, here it was, a letter addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, for Privet Drive, Little Wing, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellow parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing, checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. <laughs> Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill and the postcard, sat down, and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went from red to green, faster than a set of traffic lights, and it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the grayish white of old porridge. Ba 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 dunya he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment... It looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh my goodness, Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read the letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Get out, both of you, croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. <clears throat> Out, roared Uncle Vernon. And he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their neck and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between door and floor. Vernon, Aunt Petunia was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching, spying, might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back, tell them we don't want? Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally, no, we'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, Yes, that's best. We, we, we just won't, we won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in, we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? This is heating up. Sorry, I need a little tea break. <clears throat> Throat's a little hoarse today. It's so hard to read out loud. Okay. 
Who's laughing at me? Will ya? Okay. Um, that evening, when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter? Said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. Who's writing to me? No one. It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths and then forced his face into a smile, which looked quite painful. Er, yes, Harry, about this cupboard. Oh, I gotta show you guys the illustrations. There were no illustrations on these pages. Sorry about that. But on the next page, Your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why, said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take this stuff upstairs now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms, one for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia, one for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, one where Dudley slept, and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit into his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to his room. He sat down on the bed and stared around. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old camera was lying on top of a small working tank Dudley had once driven over next door's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he'd put his foot through when his favorite program had been canceled. There was a large birdcage which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle which was up on the shelf with all, or with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. They were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday he'd been given anything to be up, or yesterday he'd have given anything to be up here. Today, He'd rather be back in his cupboard with the letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the post arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom for Privet Drive! With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right beside him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting in which everyone got hit by a lot of the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard. I mean, your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go. Just go. Harry walked around and around his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try it again. And this time he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters for the number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Arg! Harry leapt in the air. He'd trodden on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive! Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized that the big squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying on the front of the foot... Sorry, on the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for a half an hour and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. 
Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the post had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letterbox. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia, through a mouthful of nails, if they can't deliver them, then they'll just give up. Oh, I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had just brought him. On Friday, no fewer than 12 letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the letterbox, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and even a few forced through the small windows in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nail and boarded up all the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. This is getting pretty intense. <clears throat> On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. 24 letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While well, Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find somebody... Oh, while well, Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food mixer. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly, Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them happily as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply in the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off walls and the floor. That does it, says Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts out of his mustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his mustache missing that no one dared to argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car, speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him around the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, video, and computer in his sports bag. They drove. And they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turning and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off. Shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he'd wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy-looking hotel, on the outskirts of a big city, Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold tin tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? Only I got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better to just go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plowed field. 
halfway across a suspension bridge and at the top of a multi-story car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully in the late afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley snivelled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know these things of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthday, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't 11 every day. Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she'd asked what he bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone. Everyone out. I gotta be honest with you, this chapter feels a little slow to me. I'd rather be watching the movie right now. Okay. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh yeah, no illustrations on this page, by the way. Too late, what am, you, what am I reading? Harry Potter, chapter three. All right, well, it was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out to sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin. But an old rowing boat bobbing in the... Oh, at an old rowing boat, bobbing in the iron gray water below them. I've already got us some rations, said Uncle Vernon, so all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed. The wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a packet of crisps each and four bananas. Crisps, funny word. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp packet just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver post. Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and to crawl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. People are awful. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were drowned by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd been 11. He'd be 11 in 10 minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday trick near wondering if the Dursleys would remember it all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house and Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea slapping hard on a rock like that? And two minutes to go. Was that, what was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go, and he'd be 11. 30 seconds, 20, 10, 9. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three, two, one, boom. The whole shack shivered. 
And Harry sat up right. <laughs> Try that sentence again. The whole shack shivered, and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. Oh, thank God, it's over. There's the Vernon in the rowboat. Well, that's chapter three. That one was kind of boring, to be totally honest with you guys. But we all know what happens next. But I'm going to have to save that for next week. Because it's almost 3.30 and I got shit to do. <clears throat> okay, let's take a couple minutes though. How are you guys doing? Everybody surviving okay? It's sad. I've never seen a Harry Potter movie. I've seen them all. They're great. Um, Matt turns this into a horror novel. Dun, dun, dun. That was painful. Sorry, I wasn't feeling that one today. Throat's a little raspy and I feel like I got things to do. I've committed to this though. I've got to see it through. <laughs> um, does anybody want to like do a quick video chat or something like that? Um, if you want to join me, just, I, I literally have like five minutes. So let's, let's do this. Who wants, who wants in? Question, can we still submit videos for the only the lonely survive today? I think so. I think the deadline was the 12th. I don't know what day is today. Is it the 12th? If it's the 12th, then you're fucked. But if it's not, then go ahead. Um, I s okay, hang on. I'm going to go video. Let's see who's up. Go live with... I don't know. Who the hell are you? Kristen Waiting. Silent mode, off. Connecting. Hey! Hello! How's it going? How are you? Good, what's yourself? Your, what's your name? Kristen. Hey, Kristen. I'm from Sarnia, Ontario. I like Sarnia, Ontario, I've been there. Yeah, you were just there, what, end of January? Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I missed the last concert before that because I had just had it my daughter. So I missed that one. Oh, congratulations. Well, she's two now, but, yeah. What are you, uh, great what being are you a mother. on this fine Easter Sunday? I just actually had a really good dinner. My parents brought over a meal for me, and I just had a... Uh, a really good, delicious carrot cake. Oh, yum. so good. That's awesome. So good. Did you do an mm -hmm. Easter egg hunt today or anything like that? I did, um, but my daughter, she slept in until nine, so I had amazing. to wake her up. I know, amazing. That never happens because usually I'm up at like 6 30, 7 o'clock doing a workout and then going to work. Yeah. And uh, so I had to wake her up, and then she was super excited to find all the Easter eggs around our house, the, around our house. And yeah, it was oh, great. That's awesome. I did a little, how about Easter yourself? Egg. Oh, thank, uh, yeah. I did a little uh, Easter egg hunt this, this morning as well. It was awesome. I ate a lot of chocolate over the weekend. I've just been like binging. So, uh, yeah, but it's, My it's great. Been like oh, I've been sorry, eating chocolate again? for like, <laughs> I've been eating <laughs> chocolate for trying not to, you know, I've been trying to hide it away from her, but I've been cheating. I've been, you know, sneaking in there, grabbing a few things, and yeah. Yeah, I, it's it's hard. This time of year is so hard because it's just like it's everywhere. If you go to the grocery store, then it's there's just like stacks of Easter candy everywhere. Yeah, and I've been off work for almost a month now. Me too. And uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's I work in childcare, so it's oh. like I don't think I'll be going back anytime soon. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's it's a it's a weird ass time. It is. I don't get it. I I don't get it. Yeah. It's just so. Well, I'm glad things are going well there, and I, you're safe. And yeah, thank you. I, I yeah, I'm I'm great. I'm happy and healthy, and just kind of bored to be honest with you. But it's uh, I think everybody's in the same boat right now, and. And, you know, admire everybody for doing the right thing and just staying home and trying to, oh, sure. yeah, keep everyone safe. 
because uh you know we're we're lucky or hopefully we're reasonably young and healthy and that sort of stuff and got to do the right thing for everybody that you know wouldn't be able to handle getting sick so exactly I, I don't know. yeah it's it's a weird it's a weird time it's so weird but fortunately we have harry potter i am i i i'm 34 years old never and i i don't know i just haven't really i'm just not like a i don't even know how to explain it i just I don't know. I never really got interested. It just kind of like a three hour movie, four hour movie. I just am like, oh. I think it's just, I'm like a, I like romantic, but I also like comedy and stuff like that. And like thriller. I know there's thriller yeah. in it, but I mean, yeah. I, it's just not, I don't know. Hey man, it's not, so. it's certainly not for everyone. That's for sure. That chat, that chapter I was <laughs> reading was pretty weak. I was, I was a little disappointed, but that's okay. We'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, when you first had your chat, I was like, I know, I think it was like last weekend or whatever, and I, I commented, and I was like, you should come read to my class, and then you're like, nope, not happening. I'm like, he doesn't have kids, does he? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 this is enough reading for me. It's like it's it's too hard to read out loud. Hard, harder the harder yeah the pipes. <clears throat> that's okay. I got still, I. Still that's okay. I still struggle sometimes. Even I work with like three, three year olds and I'm like yeah. reading them a story and I'm just like, yeah, I like pause so many times and I get all like, I've been doing it for 15 years and it's, it's still every day still kind of like, Oh, so. Uh, well, I'll let you continue to read with somebody else. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's very nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Have a have a super awesome happy. Easter, okay? Yeah, happy Easter. Same to you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Oh, that was nice. It is hard to read it out loud. Okay, uh, I got time for one more, really quick. Who? I hope you Photoshop your face on Draco Malfoy. Yeah, who, I wonder who's going to be next. Why is this not working? Here we go. Um, oh crap. Okay, last one. Who's this? Why is plat pie? Oh shit! Hello there. Hi. Oh shit! Hi there. What's your name? Sorry, uh, Sarah. I I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't say it. I didn't realize. How are Actually, you? <laughs> it's it's the internet. It doesn't matter. We're all we're all going. Literally, to any anything that happens during this time, it's like, sorry, it was lockdown. It's my brain on lockdown. I can't. <laughs> oh, likewise. I like your glasses. <laughs> Thank you. They have little seashells. On yeah, no, those are those prong. are sweet. That's awesome. Yeah, customized. <laughs> where uh, where are you located, there, Sarah? I'm in London, England. London, um, England. I'm yeah, Whoa. <laughs> like um, normally based in Mississauga, but uh, I came here for a master's and now I'm just here. <laughs> what school are you going to? I'm at UCL in London. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. What's, what time is there right <laughs> now? It's got to be, uh, what is it, eight hours difference or something? Or... It is out eight hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. 11, 11.30, about, just about. Oh, well, but... thanks. Thanks for watching the live stream. Oh no, it's all like I. It's really fun to see. Like I don't know, I'm a big nerd with like stories and myths, and like it's really nice that this has pushed people to have that, like, you know, storytelling and all this reading. I think it's really, I don't know. It's I think it's really important. Like hopefully we can cultivate that beyond that, so we don't have to be in an emergency situation to tell stories. But yeah, I, like I, oral yeah. storytelling is super important. Totally, I I agree with you. I I totally agree. I like doing it. It's 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 fun. I, I don't know. I'm amazed that people actually watch this, but it's uh, <laughs> it's a good book. Yeah. No, and it's just putting in little chapters also, and the the illustrations. It all helps. Good narration yeah. too. Yeah. What uh, what are you doing your master's in? Uh it's called digital anthropology. Uh, which Ooh, is I don't I don't even know what that is. Yeah, so it just, it's basically so anthropology, anything studying humans, and you know, you have digital on top of it. So anything people do online. So you can imagine how we're dealing with the situation, basically, um, you know, 
we're getting constant think pieces from students who were already analyzing online culture and now it's like nuts because everything just suddenly shifted online to all our thesis all our dissertations that were supposed to have field work now we're like we have to move online but like it's just one of the questions for this course itself is like can anthropology do you and field work be entirely online and now we have to answer the questions we're gonna have to be like this whole like graduating class where we have to do everything online for this discipline so you have no choice yeah, yeah. That, that is yeah. Kind of funny yeah. Sort of ironic. Well, that's just nerd. <laughs> Anthropology. Oh, whatever. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. it's so nice to meet you. Happy Easter, by the way. Thank you. Happy Easter to you too. Yeah, I'm gonna. Are I gotta run because I'm. I gotta go do a bunch of video chats with my mom and dad. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. No, that's for, good. Uh, Thanks yeah, for saying for that. Sure. I really, I love you. Love Maria's trying to have for you. Saw you all in London this time and it was super lovely oh amazing thank you so much it's really nice to nice to meet you thanks for the chat Bye. of course have, have a great day or a great evening <laughs> you bye too. see you sarah bye. amazing wow london england that's so cool okay i gotta go i'm really sorry uh guys thank you very much for joining me for chapter three today um, we'll do chapter four next week and I promise I'll have more energy to deliver the spoken, um, novel better. Anyways, uh, you guys have a really great Easter. Uh, again, stay safe out there, stay home, keep your distance. Um, I don't know. You guys know what to do. Have a great, great day. Okay. Talk to you later. Thanks for joining. Bye.